Hey, this is Jason Falls. Hey, this is Mari Smith. Hey, everybody, this is CC Chapman. Hey, this is Jason Keith. Michael Stelzner here. Hi there, I'm Rand Fishkin. Hey, this is John Jans. Hey, it's Jay Bear. Hey, this is Brian Solis. Hi, this is David Wells, and you're watching Inbound Now with, wait, no. Hi, this is Seth Godin, and you're watching Inbound Now with David Wells. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Inbound Now. I'm your host, David Wells, and we have a special return guest today, Mr. DJ Waldo of Waldo Social. Welcome back to the show, DJ. Hey, David. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. From a new location today, I'm in San Jose, California, where we just moved, and uh, so it's a little bit of a different backdrop as opposed to my wall. This is my backyard. I like it. I like it. Yeah. So, DJ, you're coming out with a new book that's launching towards the end of this month in August uh, with Jason Falls called The Rebel's Guide to Email Marketing, Grow Your List, Break Rules, and Win. So I really want to get you on the show to talk about some of the key concepts in the in the upcoming book and talk about list building. We're really excited about it. No, Jason and I, um, Jason approached me uh, about nine months or so ago and um, uh, you know, he, he for, for, I don't know if your listeners know this, but uh, he wrote a book called No Bullshit Social Media. And um, so this was kind of like the no bullshit email marketing, but a uh, less, little less cursing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you kind of censored Jason in this book? Uh, slightly. I mean, you, know, you, you, still, you can still definitely hear his tone and voice and my tone and voice throughout it. But uh, yeah, it's, it's the same kind of approach, though. It's, it's not your traditional email marketing book that says do this, 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 and this in that order. And, uh, you know, we really try to talk about, I mean, the, the, the bulk of the book talks about breaking the rules and, and really this idea that the only best practices when it comes to email marketing, email marketing are practices that are best for your audience. And so we try to dispel a lot of the myths that are out there and a lot of what I frankly would call bad advice around email marketing um, and share examples of companies and, and, and such that uh, are breaking those air quote rules. Right. And, uh, and actually still finding success, or winning, as I guess we say in the title. <laughs> so yeah, so that was uh, one of my questions, actually. So like, uh, you know, what are some of the obsolete rules, quote unquote, of email marketing, you know, that aren't relevant today? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of my favorite ones uh, talks about you should never use, first of all, anytime you use extremes, anytime you say you should never do this, or you should always do this, you're probably talking about a rule. Um, and one that we would we would recommend at least testing breaking and see what happens. Um, but one of my favorites is always around subject lines. People have said it used to be the case that you could not include the word free in a subject line or use all caps or exclamation points or, God forbid, use free in all caps with an exclamation point at the end. Uh, but, you know, and even if you Google, I, I actually just did this uh, just the other day for a presentation I'm giving next week. If you Google the phrase words to avoid in an email subject line, you're going to find at the very top several posts that have lists of top 100 words to avoid. And unfortunately, that advice is just outdated. Uh, it was good advice years ago, but I think this is kind of the challenge. And this is sort of the good and the bad of, of search. And, and I know you can appreciate this and, and as well as your audience that people sometimes I don't think we're doing as much research as we should be anymore. And maybe this is me getting older and stuff and a little crotchety in my, you know, set in my beliefs. But it's like, I think what happens is we've got these, you know, somebody said years ago, which was true, those types of words, free, deal, limited time, those tend to go in the spam folder more often, will get you blocked. Well, that was true five years ago. But the problem is people are recycling that content from five years ago and saying that's still true when, We've evolved, and the reality is it's no longer true. You know, if you look in your inbox today, you know, I challenge everybody out there to go to your inbox uh, and just, if you're in Google, you can search. It's really easy. Search for the word free, and you can even do subject line colon free, and you'll see all subject lines that have the word free in them, and it's, there's a tremendous number of them. It's incredible, and then, you know, it's like the word deal. Well, what if you're Groupon, or what if you're a deal of the day site? You know, you typically put deal in the subject line, and the reality is those things will not get you blocked in and of themselves. Gotcha, gotcha. So is it more based off, instead of the subject line, that seems like it's more of the archaic spam filters that, you know, if someone's using a really, really old email service provider or something, that, that might apply. But, you know, like Google and all these bigger, newer email service providers are using more like sender score and stuff like that? Yeah, exactly. A lot of it, um, 
so so and I want to be clear about something. It doesn't mean that I mean you could have you could create any filtering system at your company. I mean corporate a corporate filter you could say if a subject line contains the word free automatically junk it. I mean you can do that. I'm sure some IT folks do that. Like really if they're going to be really aggressive. But but you're right. The the, the uh, many many ES or sorry I shouldn't say ESPs really many many ISPs are now filtering based on. Uh, as you said, sender score, which is return pass term for it, but basically reputation. So how good is the domain that you're sending from? How reputable is it? Do you, does that IP address or that domain that you're sending from tend to send a lot of unsolicited mail or mail that's marked as spam more often than not? If that's the case, your mail is going to ha have a higher chance of going into the spam folder. But uh, subject line ha has, doesn't have as much of an impact anymore. Uh, even words within the body of a message do not have nearly as much of an impact as it used to be. Um, I mean, we also talk about things like all images or, you know, mostly image emails or mostly text. I mean, those are just all, they're just old and outdated. It's just not the case anymore. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool. So um, let's see here. So I have a bunch of other email questions, but I wanted to dive into list building first because that's really uh, one of the things that we're trying to do here at Inbound Now is grow our list. I know it's kind of the, the bread and butter of you know your, your internet marketing, um, yep. but could you explain to business owners uh, out there watching, you know, why is it so critical to grow your own in-house list? Yeah, so um, I would just say, I mean, we actually talk about this in the book. I mean, it's the, the reason we start with growing your list is that you know, you can have the most, you can have the best podcast in the world. You can have the, you can have the best product to offer at the best price that everybody wants, and the most, the best subject line, the most create creative copy, the most compelling call to action. But if you don't have anybody to send to, if you're sending to two people, then none of that matters, right? So the idea is you have to have a list. To, and you have to be constantly building that list. I mean, there's also stats out there that show churn rates are, are close to 30%, meaning you're going to lose close to 30% of your list year over year because of people unsubscribing, marking it as spam, changing email addresses, or just um, what, what we would term, uh, actually, I think it's, it was DelaQuest, a colleague of mine termed, uh, emotion, no, sorry, unemotionally subscribed. <laughs> which means people who are on your list but don't take any kind of action. So you might have a list of 10,000, but 3,000 of them haven't opened an email from you in four years. Um, they're pretty much dead email addresses, right? right. So um, the whole, I guess the whole idea is that you have, to have, you have to not only have a list, but you have to be constantly growing that list in order to uh, be able to do email marketing effectively. There's, there's really no point. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so growing the list, what are what are some things you've seen companies implement that work extremely well in actually growing that list? Yeah. So, so still, uh, yeah. You know, one of the biggest ones is actually just putting. This sounds so obvious. It's almost. I feel awkward even saying it every time. But it's putting an opt-in form on your site. Uh, I, I I did an exercise at the University of Utah Business School. Where I taught a, a class there in email marketing, and um, I had all the students go, and I said, okay, just name. Just, just brainstorming your group five companies off the top of your head. Just any five. Don't even think about what they are. And I said, now go to those websites, and I want somebody to time how long it takes to, A, find the opt-in form, B, fill out the form, and D, hit submit. Like, how long that process is. Now, this is, of course, not a true study, so let me be very clear about that. Uh, but, you know, the sample size was 30, and it was not, you know, unique. <laughs> Is, uh, um, it's good uh, enough. It's good enough. But the point is, I, I would say two to th at least two, average of two of those five companies did did not even have an opt-in form on their website. So there's people that want to get emails from you, and you don't even have that option. At least one of those five had it, but it was so hard to find. It was buried all the way at the bottom. It was hidden in the sidebar, um, and there was only a handful of them that had it. It was easy to find, and it was just very very easy to subscribe. So. I know that sounds so obvious, but really the first thing is to make sure that you have your opt-in form on your website. It's easy to find. It's easy to opt in. You're not asking for hundreds of different fields. Not to say that you can't do that. I mean, that works for some people. But if you're putting barriers in front of people who want to get your email, you're doing it wrong. Gotcha, gotcha. So uh, what are your thoughts on pop-up, you know, lightbox pop-ups to say, hey, subscribe to our list or, or stuff it like that? 
I hate them. Hate them. Hate them. They work though. It's like, I hate them, but well, so that's that. That's the whole point we'd make in the book. That was actually like a good. It was a good exchange there. Uh, no, I hate them. I really, I honestly, I hate them. To me, they bother me. I rarely opt into something when it pops up on the screen. I want to close it. I'm just, you know, I think about back in the day when you have to like move your mouse around the screen and try to find the box to close, it, and then like 16 other screens pop up. Um, but, but you, we talk about this in the book. That's a no-no in the email marketing world is to do a pop-up to collect email addresses. Yet, for many, many people, it works. And we give examples of um, a, a fellow Bostonian, Chris Penn who has used pop-ups on his site for over a year now, and uh, he's seen tremendous list growth. In fact, just recently, uh, and you might be able to find these blo- the blog posts on this. It's um, ChristopherSPenn.com. Right. Um, the title of the blog post is Pop-Ups Are Back. And he tried an experiment for, I think it lasted three weeks. He removed the pop-up. His, as he, I think his, his terminology, he said, opt-ins went off the cliff completely dropped off. So for him, it works. We give an example in the book about um, the company Funny or Die, which is one of my absolute favorite websites. Um, and they have a pop-up. Now, what they do that's very unique about theirs is it doesn't show until you go three different pages deep into their web. So their point is, hey, you've got you've to be committed to this content a little bit. We're not going to throw it up in your face until you're actually showing that you're somewhat invested in the content. Gotcha, gotcha. I think that would actually be a, a good a good best practice to implement. Um, I have a delay on mine. Uh, I've been back and forth. I've seen the exact same thing that Chris Penn saw, um, and Dan Zarella did a study on it as well. Like when you take it off, like it just goes off a cliff. It's very yeah. it's very noticeable, um, and some people do complain. But you know, well, you have to be. You know, you, you know, it's interesting because you have to. I think with all marketing that you do, you have to be aware that a couple things. One, you're definitely not going to please everybody. Uh, two, there's going to be people that hate your site and the far majority or hate something about your site. They're never going to tell you. I mean, you have no idea. So it's possible there's a ton of people that hate Chris Penn's pop-up. But it's also possible that, you know, for him it's working because he's getting more email subscriptions, which is one of his goals of his website. Gotcha, gotcha. So, you know, once you, you know, implement, and it's very simple, it's, it's, it seems so, you know, oh, no, no brainer, add a form to your site. Once you add that, you're, you're going to start to see an increase, obviously, in subscriptions. Um, yep. Once those people are in the door, though, you know, what are some key things that, that you need to do to kind of keep them engaged on that list? You know, is it email yeah, newsletters? I, is it? Yeah. I mean, first and foremost, I think you have to, in in that opt-in form, you have to provide them something of like what's in it for me or some kind of value, set some expectations. What, it, what should they expect when they get your email? So, you know, on my, on my opt-in form, for example, I actually give a quote from somebody I used to work with that shares why she opted in for this email and why she lo- looks forward to getting, in it, getting it in her inbox every morning. And so I have a little bit of a value, you know, value poll there. Um, but also I tell you what you're going to get. You're going to get the best of the best email marketing content delivered every Friday morning. And, and then when you opt in, I send a welcome email. And the welcome email doesn't have to be crazy, but it's something, it's, it at least says, hey, we're gr- glad to have you. Thanks for subscribing. And it just reiterates, here's what to expect. Here's what you're going to get. Look for that next email on whatever day. Um, so I think that's really important. And then, you know, the, the, the third big thing is, is providing value. In fact, um, on waldosocial.com just this morning, I wrote a blog post. Um, I think it was, I think I titled it the least valuable email of all time. So I got an email from Amazon payments recently and it basically said your payment to Jan Eric, who's my brother-in-law was denied. And then in the body of the email, it said your payment of $80 to Jan Eric was denied for help. Click on this link. And it was a link to their generic help. So it didn't tell me why it didn't tell me I couldn't reply to it because it was a no reply email address. So basically, you know, there was absolutely zero value in that. And I wrote in the post, I said, you know, and you, I know you know this stuff, but, um, you know, you could, they could have at least said, here is a link to a blog post of the top five reasons why payments get denied. Right. Or here's an FAQ section on our site for, and, and, you know, make it, give me some kind of value. So I think in general, you have to make sure that what you're providing your audience has some value to them. That's the key. Gotcha, gotcha. 
So uh, when putting together your your email newsletter, you know, are, are there any email newsletters out there that are done extremely well? That, that one of the problems that I'm having with my newsletter is coming up with the content, aggregating it all together, making something nice and pretty. I'm very much a perfectionist in that sense. And yeah. getting out an email newsletter is, is a challenge for, for me uh, right now. But like, what kind of advice would you give there? Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, I used to be that guy that said it's got to be perfectly designed. It's got to look nice, all this. But, you know, we've got exa- there's tons of examples in there that the people who's I mean, Chris Penn, going back to Chris, Chris sends out an email every Sunday night. It's one of the ugliest looking emails I've ever seen. And he's redesigned it to look better. I think it's ugly. It's terrible. <laughs> It's formatted kind of funky, um, but I can tell you that it performs for him. People click on links. It's just, I mean, it's a kind of email. If you were to print it out, it's four pages long, you know, um, but it works for his audience. Chris Brogan sends out a, another Bostonian, um, sends out a, an email that's almost all text that works for him. It works for his audience. Uh, I get also very creative emails from a lot of online retailers. That works. Um, for, you know, showing a lot of images works for them. Uh, I think the key is, you know, you have to remember most, the average person is not going to notice the little things. I mean, to, to speak directly to what you're saying, I mean, I'm a perfectionist too. Um, although I will say as I've gotten older, I've softened up just a little bit in that area. You know, you have to remember most people aren't going to see that, you know, unless it's like, like me, I sent an email out the other day to my list and my mom replies back and told me I had a typo. Um, but most people don't notice that stuff <laughs> mom, right? Uh, and she's a teacher and she always tells you that stuff. Um, so I think what, what you have to do is figure out a way to streamline the process. Um, one of the things I do with my weekly newsletter is, um, you know, so my newsletter talks about the best of the best email marketing content from the week. So I write it on Thursday. I block out time on Thursday to write. I take no more than an hour to write it. And during the, the week, uh, I use Evernote. And every time I see an article that I really like, I just I just grab the URL for that article, I paste it into Evernote, and then when I go to write the newsletter, I've got all my content there. So I'm not all of a sudden sitting down on Thursday and saying, what should I write about today? Uh, right. It's all, it's just, it's just a matter of plugging things in. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, so I just need to find it. I, I just need to aggregate, because I retweet articles all the time that I read, so I might as well just kind of save on that list get the best of the best right do you write a quick snippet about what it's about or do a little i do a personalized snippet about what i think yeah i mean um i do a little you can go to waldosocial.com slash email and you could you could sign up and you could see what i do but but i mean yeah i do a little i do my take on on that particular article um and so i I, and i do a little lead in a little little outro and i have a little some sidebar things that talk about my business and some other things i'm doing but for the most part it's content um, I think what you have to remember, people, people, especially in the social space, they worry a lot that, well, somebody already saw that I tweeted that already, or I wrote a blog post about that. Well, unless you're living, breathing social media like, like you and I do, most people don't see that. You know, if I tweet something or retweet it, 99.999% of my friends don't ever see it. Right. So, Email allows that. You, you can repurpose that stuff. and it's fun. I mean, even if you just did, I've seen people send out emails that all they do is show all their tweets, you know, all their retweets or whatever it is from, from the week. Right. Do that. You know, people don't see it. It's just, re, you know, it's like reimagining content, gotcha, as Anthony gotcha. and PC Chapman would say. More Bostonians. <laughs> all the marketers are in Boston. That's uh, it's pretty true. Um, Seems to cool. Be- so switching gears back into email marketing best practices, um, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about um, subject lines and how, you know, all these uh, older keywords that you can't use, you can actually use now. Um, yep. but, but in the book, you talk also about optimization, about like different pieces in the email. Um, what, are, what are the main kind of components of the email to optimize an A-B test? Yeah, yeah. so uh, we, we refer to in the book as the anatomy of an email. And uh, the, the idea is there, there are several different parts, just like a human body, there's several different parts of an email, and each one of them you have the power to control, tweak, modify, test, etc. cetera. Um, and so it starts always with the from name and the subject line. Those are the two things that people see before they even open the email. So who's the email from? Is it somebody you trust? Do you recognize? Are you likely to open it based on that? And then there's the subject line. Is the subject line creative? Is it compelling? Or is it tell it how it sees it? So Chris Penn, another going back to him, 
his subject line is pretty generic, but it tells exactly what's in the newsletter. It says Chris Penn's almost timely newsletter, and then he shows the date. I, I think it's boring, but it's, it, it tells you what exactly the contents are. Then there's also a part of the email called the pre-header, and that's literally the, the space above the header image. And that's where you can put some text in. You usually see for most emails, uh, it says view this and you know, having trouble seeing images, view online. But there's a great opportunity there to also put a call to action. You could put a link that goes back to, I do, for me, I do my most, most recent blog post. But you could do, if you're a retailer, you could do, you know, 20% off, buy now, click this link kind of stuff. Um, then as you go down the message, there's the header, which is usually an image. It might have some, some navigation. And then the bulk of the email should be your main call to action. What is it that you want people to do? Do you want them to listen to your podcast? Do you want them to read a blog post? Do you want them to buy a product, sign up for a webinar? Um, whatever that main call to action is, that should be prominent and very clear. If you, have to, if you read an email and say, I don't know what they want me to do, then the email marketer probably isn't doing their job. Uh, and then as you kind of go down from there, there's secondary, tertiary calls to action. Those could be on the sidebar. They can be below it. Those are things that, for the most part, marketers want people to click on. They want you to click through, but it's not, it's not the main purpose of the, of the email. Gotcha. So There's would that the, be an example of, like, you know, social media links or, like, you know, follow us on, you know, Twitter or something like that? Or That can be. Those, those typically are more in the footer, um, which, which we talk about in the book. Actually, one of the rules is, like, the unsubscribe link is moving it to the top, you know, and, and, and giving people the option to unsubscribe. Uh, in fact, I put it in my pre-header. You know, if you want off the list, that's fine with me. Unsubscribe here. Right. Uh, social sharing icons could be secondary or tertiary calls to action, um, depending on how your email is set up. Uh, so, but, but again, we typically find them in the footer, and sometimes I think I'm seeing more and more people moving them to the top of the email now. Gotcha. So with the call to action, do you, the main call to action, do you uh, have that as plain text and just make it, you know, a bigger font size, or are you actually using, like, call to action graphics for those? It could, could be whatever you want. I, I, I recommend doing all three. And by, by all three, I mean putting an image, including a button, and a link. Um, and, and the reason being is everybody responds to email differently, right? I mean, some people see an image and they can't wait to click on it. Um, some people, like let's say if you're my mom or dad, they don't necessarily think about images as clickable, so they would click on the link. Some people see a button that says buy now or subscribe now or opt in is that call to action. They're more apt to do that. And most email service providers will be able to show you what links people are clicking on. So if those are all unique URLs, you can tell which of your what which subscribers are clicking on which particular links. Gotcha, gotcha. So talking about uh, email service providers, which which would you recommend? Uh, so I, I, you know, it's really tough to recommend one because there, there, there. I mean, there's hundreds of them out there. Right. Um, I think it depends on what level of of email marketing needs you have. So if you're kind of in the basic, you know, just sort of doing things basically, you could do, you know, something like a MailChimp or Constant Contact or AWeber. Um, and as you kind of move up, there's more features. So a Bronto, or where I used to work, or Infusionsoft, who happens to be a client of mine, um, the feature set is going to be a little richer, Silver Pop, Exact Target. Um, but you're going to pay more. And you're probably going to have a higher level of support and client service help as well. Right. And then you've got, you know, I know this is for small businesses, so this probably isn't relevant, but you've got the cheetah mails of the world to, you know, your, your more enterprise type solutions. Gotcha, gotcha. So let's see here. So, um, oh, okay. So in, with, with email design, you kind of mentioned it a little bit earlier. Uh, are, are you more of a fan of like a minimalistic kind of look and feel of an email? Because I know if you add in, you know, your site's navigation at the top and sidebars and all this stuff, you start cluttering up the email. So, yeah. so what's your kind of take on that? Yeah, I, I mean, it, so, so we give examples in the book too. It, if, you're, if you're somebody who's an online retailer, um, mostly text emails probably are not going to be as powerful for you. So we give an example in the book of Ibex, who's a clothing retailer based in Vermont, and they pride themselves on imagery. I mean, you know, people want to see what they're buying. So if they were to do a plain text email, it's probably going to be less, just less appealing. Um, you know, King Arthur Flowers also, I think, in Vermont, um, you know, they put pictures of food in their email. I mean, it just would be, wouldn't be as appealing. Now, Again, the other extreme of that is somebody like uh, Derek Halpern, 
um, from social triggers. He includes almost all text in his emails, and he's found that working working well for him. Um, I actually surveyed my subscribers and I said, which would you rather see? Um, and overwhelmingly, people said uh, what I would call HTML light. So, uh, you know, not overwhelming number of images and not over overwhelming number of buttons. Mostly text still, but enough to kind of not make it just bland and boring. Right. Right. Okay. Cool. But again, this is you know we talk in the book about breaking the rules. So you know we give examples of both extremes for sure. Yeah. I I, I try to do the minimalistic approach where it still has some some design elements to it, but it's very text focused as well. So. Yeah. I mean, if that, you know, and then you look at your analytics and see what works for you. By the way, my dog wanted to get on Skype, so there she is. All right, special, special guest. Yeah, special cool. guest. So at the, uh, towards the end of the book, you talk about uh, the short versus long-term future of email marketing. Um, so, so what exactly are you talking about there? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the thing about email marketing is, is it's, in a lot of ways, email hasn't changed. I mean, if you think about it, for the most part, you write an email, you pick a list of your people you're going to send to, and you hit send. And yeah, you can track some things, you can see who opened it, but that's the fundamentals of email. And I think where we're starting to see email evolve to is it's obviously becoming more social. I mean, that's by including social sharing icons, social connecting icons, um, you're seeing where you can do a lot of things. You can do email from within social platforms now. Uh, I know Salesforce.com years ago added an email element. I know HubSpot you know, has now gotten into email. Right. And so there, there's a lot of this blend between um, you know, pure play email service providers and then other solutions as well. Um, so I really think we're going to see, I, I hope we're going to see a lot more personalization, a lot more targeted emails. So you know, I'd love to see the, world, the day when uh, you send a, an, an email out to your list, and based on, uh, you know, everybody, literally everybody on your list sees a different email. It's possible today, um, right. but it's not happening all that much. And it can, and it's, and if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's sophisticated email marketing. But you know, for your audience, for example, may, maybe based on what, you know, you, you you do some kind of run some metrics based on what they've clicked most often, and that's the kind of content they get. Um, you know, Amazon does that, I think, in some ways. You know, you've purchased, they do it in little blocks of content. So you've purchased this, therefore you might like that, that sort right. of thing. So, yeah, so maybe in the future, and doing so, that stuff right now is, is, a, is extremely complicated, right? So maybe moving into the future, they'll be easier to use tools, you know. To... And, and don't get me wrong, there's email service providers today that can do that. You, you, you know, if you're talking to small right. business owners, uh, you know, you, you might be, that might, you know, be a mortgage payment. Exactly, exactly. Cool. So, uh, DJ, thanks for coming on the show. Where can people find you online? Uh, they can go to search engine of your choice and type in DJ period W, I'm sorry, DJ space W-A-L-D-O-W, -W, or um, my name, DJ Waldo, pretty much any social handle. Um, I've owned them. That's one of the advantages of having a name like DJ Waldo. It's, awesome. it's available. Yeah. I'm sure you've gotten your entire life. Where's Waldo? <laughs> yeah, all since yeah, since day one. In fact, when the, I don't know if you you're old enough to remember this, but there was the I think it was the Van Halen um, Van Halen video, Hot for Teacher. It's one of the one of the first MTV videos, <laughs> and early MTV videos. And there's this the guys there's a the scene on the bus. The guy's name there's like this little nerdy guy named Waldo, and it's this whole black and white video. And he's and there's a scene on the bus, and they yell, "Sit down, Waldo." <laughs> And I was about his age when the video came out. So I heard, where's Waldo? And then I used to hear, sit down, Waldo, a lot. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Good time. Well, yeah, thanks for coming on the show. When the book launches, I'm definitely grabbing a copy because um, I definitely need to grow my list and, and really nail down what I'm doing with email because that's still you know, you something even, that I'm working on. You can pre-order it right now if you want it. You hey, can go there to, you go. I'm going to pre-order it. By slash Rebels Guide. You can pre-order it today. You don't even have to wait. It'll be at your door in September. Fantastic, fantastic. All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming hey. on. We'll get you back on for round three sometime soon, right? Sounds good. Hey, thanks. Awesome.